It's been called antiquated, unfair, and out of touch. Is it time to reform or even abolish the Indian Act? Joining us now to debate that in Dana Point, California, via Skype, Christopher Alcantara, Associate Professor of Politics at Wilfrid Laurier University and the co-author of Beyond the Indian Act, Restoring Aboriginal Property Rights. In Victoria, B.C., via Skype, Tobold Rollo. He's a Ph.D. candidate in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. And with us here in studio, Jonathan Kay, columnist with the National Post, and Douglas Anderson, Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Toronto. And it's very nice to see you two guys back here in the studio. And to our friend in, in uh, Points Beyond, thanks for joining us via Skype, uh, a long way from our studios here at Young and Eglinton. I just want to start by putting a, a few things from a graphic up on the screen here so you can... Um, I guess we can all be on the same page as it relates to the Idle No More protest that we've heard so much about. Here are some of the key concerns from the Idle No More protest. For example, the difficult process for First Nations to lease reserve land, the lack of so-called meaningful dialogue between the Government of Canada and First Nations, the government imposed legislation without adequate consultation, that's what we hear, changes to the Navigable Waterways Protection Act, and of course the problematic nature of the Indian Act, more about which we will discuss today. John, I want to start with you because uh, I've been reading your dispatches and you obviously just got back from a trip at uh, Moose Factory, Fort Albany, Keshechewan, Attawapiskat. Uh, start us off by just telling us about the major concerns that you heard from the people that you spoke to up there. What were they? It was an interesting trip because um, from following the Idle No More dialogue, you'd think that it was just a series of complaints against the government, but it's, it's actually not like that at all. There's, there's complaints about the federal government but there's also a lot of inward-looking uh, thought that's going on up there. I think people there realize that they have to become more independent, that they have to become uh, more commercially successful. Uh, they have to do a better job of managing their communities. Um, and you know, these folks are managing the legacy of residential schools and that sort of thing, but the idea that they use the past as an excuse for everything that's wrong with their communities is wrong. Uh, it was actually very inspiring. I met a lot of people who really had a self-help attitude and they are ready to move beyond a lot of the Indian Act solutions that have been imposed on them for Fair generations. Fair to say not what you expected to hear? Um, I think a lot of the focus has been on some of the angriest and most militant demonstrators. Um, and a lot of those demonstrators just blame everything on the federal government. But if you go into people's homes, if you talk to pe just ordinary people on reserves, um, they have a whole range of views and they realize that there are a lot of people at fault and there are a lot of things that they themselves are going to have to do in order to face their challenges. Just before we go on with our discussion, we very much want to get you, the viewer, involved in this program. So producer Mary Taz and our online producer Naveen Viswani are hosting a Twitter chat right now. So let us know your thoughts on the Indian Act. You can use the hashtag Agenda TVO. That's hashtag Agenda TVO. Chime in with your thoughts and join our discussion. Tobold, uh, let me bring you in at this point. If the Indian Act were scrapped or at least significantly amended, how far do you think that would go to allaying the concerns that you've heard from Idle No More? Well, uh, any changes to the Indian Act are going to affect uh, Indigenous communities profoundly. Uh, if we're not going to recreate the same sorts of problems or introduce new problems in dealing with the Indian Act, though, we have to keep in mind two things. Uh, the first is that any shift away from the Indian Act or within the Indian, the Indian Act has to be uh, done at the pace and according to the needs of particular communities. Uh, if we just dictate from above which changes to the Indian Act are going to take place, then we're going to run into similar complaints that... Uh, Indigenous peoples aren't the agents of, uh, their, of the change that needs to, to uh, occur. The, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, the changes that will take place under the Indian Act um, are going to affect uh, these Indigenous communities in ways that are unexpected. So we have to keep uh, all the sorts of um, all the doors open uh, when considering what to change. I think I need to have a bit of a translation here. And Douglas, maybe I can get you to, to translate this for me. Tobolt said that things need to change at the pace and need of the communities involved. Explain what that means. 
Well, I, I, uh, I, I think what I can say is that uh, First Nations communities are, of course, uh, many and varied. There's at least 630 of them uh, across the country, and they range from quite large communities of close to 10,000 people to very small communities of 300 or less people. Some of them are remote fly-in access only and have no access to roads. Uh, supplies get um, sent up river uh, during the summer, and uh, some are right next door to our largest urban centers. So, the Indian Act as an instrument is kind of, it's fairly blunt. Um, and so reform of the Indian Act uh, should probably take into consideration the fact that different communities are at different stages of economic development. Well, one um, size is not going to fit all here. One size is it's not going to be going done to fit differently. All. It's, a com it's, going, it, it's a series of complicated problems that require a series of complicated solutions. There's not going to be one simple solution uh, that will address all of the concerns of all of the First Nations Understood. communities. John, follow up? You know, actually, I saw a really interesting example of this when I was up at James Bay because, there's, as you mentioned, there's several communities there. And just within that fairly small geographical, geographical area, you have Attawapiskat, which is fairly poor, uh, fairly remote. And then down south, uh, you have uh, the uh, Moose Factory, an island where you have uh, Cree communities. And that is more developed. It's closer, it's closer to the rail line. It's closer to Moosonee. It's closer to a city. And you see this huge difference where up in Attawapiskat, they still, still are heavily dependent on people bringing in trailers, building homes for them. I mean, it's an extreme dependency relationship. Whereas when I interviewed people in Moose Cree, they couldn't wait to get away from certain strictures of the Indian Act. The example that was given to me by the chief, he said, you know, a couple of decades ago, when we needed homes, uh, you'd get Department of Indian Affairs folks, and they say, well, here's $490,000, build 10 homes. And we're going to come and inspect them, make sure you build it, it's on budget. And he said, we couldn't build a home for $49,000. But we were tied into this dependency relationship. We didn't control the land fully because it was under the Indian Act, so it's held in trust by the federal government. And they were ready to move on, and they have moved on, because now they've moved to more of a mortgage model, and they've gotten away from that funding model from, from INAC. And it's clearly a community that was ready to move on. They have more commercial opportunities because they're near a city, they're well, a large town, which is Moosonee. And good governance, uh, familiar with the, there's a big hospital there. So clearly a community that was ready to move away on their terms. And they have done to a certain extent. Whereas Attawapiskat, which is just about 250 kilometers away, is nowhere near right. at that level. They're at a completely different stage of so development. Further evidence that one way of approaching this is not going to be satisfactory for I agree, everybody. And, and I, I agree with uh, what was said, that it has to be done at a at, at different pace according to local conditions. If you went to Attawapiskat tomorrow and said, guess what, we're liberating you from the Indian Act. Go build some homes. Um, they wouldn't be able to do that. They don't have the education level. They don't have the resources. Uh, these things take decades. I think it's a goal, but I think it has to be done according to a pace which is contingent on the conditions in the community. Christopher Alcantara, can I get you to weigh in on that from California and tell us whether you think if the Indian Act were scrapped or at least significantly changed in a, in a meaningful way, uh, whether that would go a long way towards allaying the concerns of idle no more? Yeah, I think so. I think that uh, the Indian Act is a, uh, creates a major constraint on the ability of Indigenous peoples to uh, participate in the Canadian economy, participate in the uh, political structures of the Canadian state, uh, to, to uh, meaningful, meaningfully exercise self-determination, self-government. And so the goal is to um, eliminate the Indian Act in some way. However, uh, you can't just get rid of the Indian Act. It has to be done in an incremental uh, type of way. There's been attempts in the past to get rid of the Indian Act, uh, in most notably Trudeau's white paper, uh, Credit Chance Government, when they tried to pass the First Nations Governance Act. But these all failed probably because they were these top-down, broad-sweeping changes. And so I agree with the panelists. It has to be a more of an incremental uh, type of process that recognizes the individual um, uh, concerns and, and conditions that First Nations and other, um, other groups uh, face. And so... Uh, so, so there, there has to be that type of incremental approach, and uh, uh, you know, there, there's a model uh, that exists, the First Nations Land Management Act, as well as the First Nations Property Ownership Act, two pieces of legislation that came from First Nations themselves that provide alternatives to the land management provisions in the Indian Act. And these are voluntary bottom-up uh, approaches that First Nations have developed with the Crown and can pursue and opt into, and I think that's going to be the goal in terms of, uh, that's the process for how to get around the Indian Act and to replace it. Okay, having established that the country needs a more nuanced approach to tackling this issue, uh, Douglas, I want to bring you in, but before we do that, I want to read just a, a short precy here about what the Indian Act is about, because it's been around for a very long time, and there's still lots of Canadians who are not completely up to scratch on it. For example, 
The Indian Act was enacted way back in 1867 at the dawn of the country. It has, of course, been amended since. It allows the government essentially to control many aspects of Aboriginal life in Canada, including the status of Indians, land and resources, wills, education, band administration. Significantly, Inuit and Métis are not governed by this law. In older versions of the law, the attempt was to assimilate the native population. You'll remember the residential schools crisis. The government, and formerly the Crown, has a fiduciary obligation to protect Aboriginal interests and their lands. So that's some of what the Indian Act is all about. And I guess, Douglas, I want you to follow up by telling us what, in your view, the problematic sections of the Indian Act are in its current incarnation. Well, there are uh, very many sections of the Indian Act that I, I think pose uh, operational problems uh, for many First Nations communities. So let me just say that the uh, original Act from 1867 has been amended. Um, and the most significant rev revisions uh, were from the early 1950s. Um, and those revisions allowed First Nations people to vote in federal elections. Um, they uh, uh, made it possible for First Nations people to hire lawyers, uh, which they weren't able to do under previous iterations of the Act. Policy uh, was um, uh, redone by the federal crown so that the uh, system, uh, the past system of reserve was revoked and no longer in place. So First Nations could move off their reserve communities um, so these freely. So po positive developments in your view? They certainly were, yes. Okay. Uh, they were long overdue by, by the 1950s. But that is the last significant reform. The rest of the Act uh, remains virtually unchanged from its 1867 incarnation. And the, so the Act achieves um, the goals of a Victorian era government. And that largely was a goal of assimilation. It was a, it was a, a, a set of uh, legislation designed uh, to limit the ability of First Nations people to act as free and autonomous beings uh, in their own territory and with their own property. Um, so those still sec those sections of the Act, the interesting the residential school section you mentioned, the current Indian Act uh, is unchanged from the 1920s. So all of the powers and authorities that are granted by the uh, Indian Act to the Federal Crown still exist in the Indian Act. They still have the right to take children, to send them to residential schools, to allow those schools to be operated by, uh, um, by religious institutions. Uh, it provides for the forced entry into the homes of parents who uh, might not want their children to go to residential school. It applies to all Indian children, including mine, even though I don't in live on an Indian Reserve. And it also provides the power uh, for truant officers. The, the section of the Act actually says, I think it's 116, uh, that a truant officer may use whatever force he or she deems necessary uh, to uh, bring a child to a school. And would you want to scratch all of those sections you just mentioned? Largely, yes. But at the same time, there does need to be a section in the Indian Act about schools because First Nations communities need the power to, or they, they need the regulatory and legislative authority to operate schools in their communities. That's what that section of the Indian Act can do. It goes much, much beyond that. And so lots of that can be repealed. Uh, while remaining in place uh, the authority for First Nations communities to build and operate schools and authority for uh, the federal legislature to um, obtain uh, money from the Treasury in order to fund those schools. Okay. So those sections up. need to stay. Let me follow up with Tobold here because it, it, this has been so much in the news lately, Tobold, of course, because of <coughs> uh, the so-called hunger strike by Theresa Spence, uh, the chief, and of course by, by the Idle No More protests, that many Canadians may be asking themselves if this act is so heinous, why not just eliminate it? Scratch it out in one fell swoop. What's the answer to why that ought not or cannot be done? Well, the Indian Act is a, has a contradiction built into it in that, uh, uh, in the one sense, like as Doug pointed out, it contains this Victorian era paternalistic colonialism, uh, but it also contains the language of Canada's fiduciary responsibilities to Indigenous communities. Uh, you can find that outside of the Indian Act as well, uh, in uh, Supreme Court decisions and in the, in the uh, Royal Proclamation and uh, in, certain, in work on Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. But uh, so scrapping the Indian Act is... Um, a, is a good idea for some, but as long as the fiduciary responsibilities are, are uh, put into some other legislation so that we don't get rid of Canada's responsibilities uh, to Indigenous peoples because they have a unique standing in uh, the Canadian legal and political framework. Uh, so there's lots of work on what kind of alternatives uh, 
uh, could be enacted. Uh, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples uh, had a program, 20-year program, for honouring uh, the fiduciary responsibility while scrapping all of the sort of arcane and uh, paternalistic, paternalistic aspects of the Act. Okay, again, Christopher, let me get you in at this point as we pull the cover back from this Act and find out what exactly, for example, what degrees of protection does the Indian Act provide to First Nations in this country uh, that it, uh, presumably protections that other Canadians would not have? Help us understand that. Well, in many ways, uh, the Indian Act is basically the expression, the legislative expression of the federal government's responsibilities to First Nations. So, uh, you know, any type of activity that occurs on reserves has to flow through, for the most part, through the Indian Act. So whether it's governance, education, health care, economic development, property rights, uh, taxation, for instance, the uh, exemptions about taxation are found in the Indian Act. And so in that sense, Indian Act... Uh, um, uh, fulfills a legal duty of the crown. You, know, you need something given the given the legal duty of the crown. You need some sort of legislation to allow the federal government to undertake these activities uh, to fulfill its treaty rights, uh, its treaty treaty promises to First Nations. And so that's what the Indian Act does. It, it allows, it gives the federal government the legislative authority to provide all of the things that it, it is uh, pro it, it promised or supposedly had promised to First Nations. Let's play a clip now, and John, I want to give you first crack at responding to this clip. Not too long ago, we had a First Nations policy analyst named Russ Diabo on this program, and he posted an informational video about the Indian Act in the wake of Idle No More. Let's play a clip of that, and then we're going to come back with a question to you. Roll tape, please. I would describe the situation of uh, First Nations in Canada um, as being one of being in a colonial situation, because Canada is still using the Indian Act as the main statute or law to control and manage Indians, status Indians or First Nations. Um, and that law goes back to 1876. And although it's been amended from time to time, it's still being used to control and manage Indians, like I said. And that's a colonial relationship. John, do you agree with Russell's characterization of the relationship between First Nations and the government of Canada as one of, still, colonialism? Uh, no, because a defining feature of colonialism is a desire to extract resources from the colonized lands. In Canada, I think the financial relationship is, is different now, at least, in that we, we spend money. Uh, some would argue we don't spend enough, but we spend some, the federal government spends something on the order of $10 billion a year to maintain lives on reserves. Uh, provincial governments spend more. So there's actually an outlay of cash <clears throat> to reserves. So I, I would disagree with the idea that it's a colonial, colonial relationship. However, I would agree that it is a paternalistic relationship. And the biggest reason it's a paternalistic relationship is the biggest aspect of the Indian Act is that we deny natives who live on reserves the right to own their own land in the way that you or I might own our own homes. Okay. Uh, well, this is something that if you look at the language of the Act, not just the language of the Act, but the language of treaties, the idea is that these lands are reserved for the collective use of, of bands and tribes, and um, that hasn't changed. So if you live on a reserve, there are all kinds of systems, that, you know, certificates of possession and that sort of thing. But ultimately, at the end of the day, a person living in a house, they might be able to own the house, they can't own the land under it. And this is a huge problem because the main way that people in Canada and all capitalist countries develop wealth is by owning property. And it's the one systematic right that we deny people on reserves. The problem here is there's another contradiction, is that the left in Canada kind of romanticizes that aspect of it because it reminds them of sort of Soviet-type land collectives. And there's, I think there's a huge divergence between people who live on reserves, and a lot of them, I think, would love to own their own property. And yet, if you go to the university activist left in Canada, they kind of romanticize and sentimentalize that aspect of the reserve system, which is, is the most patronizing acts aspect of the Indian Act. And ironically, it's the one aspect that a lot of these, I don't know, no more activists want to keep. Well, let me pick up on the last part there. Is it in fact the case that more First Nations in this country would like to own the land under their individuals, homes, individuals, individuals yeah. but, yeah, right, as opposed to banned administrations, but individuals, would they like to own the land but can't? I don't know. Um, I, I think you'd have to do some actual survey data to find that out. What I, what I can say is that um, I 
believe that there are some subsets of some problems in some communities that might be solved by uh, private property ownership, and people, some groups of people uh, might want that. But on the whole, uh, to focus on uh, private property ownership is uh, probably going in the wrong direction, uh, because it's not actually going to solve problems uh, that First Nations communities seek, except for, as I say, some small subset of problems in some communities. There are some First Nations communities uh, who are still living under the Indian Act who are doing just fine. Uh, in terms of their economic development through leasing of lands and long-term leasing of lands, which are provided for in the Act. It is a cumbersome process, to be sure. And uh, the First Nations Land Management Act has made some of that easier. And so I'm not saying under no circumstances should we think about private property. I just think that private property uh, on First Nations communities is not a solution to any number of problems. It's a solution to a very limited set of problems. Okay, having and said that. so to pursue that as a political objective in the face of massive opposition is just to, to, to make the relationship so much more difficult. I, I do need to get equal yeah. time here to the guy whose subtitle is Restoring Aboriginal Property, right? So Christopher Alcantara, right. can you come on in here and tell us whether you believe if First Nations people, not the Ban administration, but if the people could own the land underneath the homes in which they live, would that go some distance towards solving some of the problems that John Kay just outlined? I think it would, uh, I think it would, uh make a big difference for a number of communities um, because it, uh, the idea of individual property ownership is about unlocking the economic potential of lands and allowing individuals to become more entrepreneurial. It's not a magic bullet. Uh, we've, we've been very clear in our book about that, that it's not a magic bullet. It's not going to solve all the problems, but it's a really important, we think it's a very important tool that First Nations uh, want, some First Nations want and that all First Nations should have available to them. It's, you know, the uh, allowing individual property ownership allows First Nations to expand markets. Right now, if you, own, if you own land as an individual through some of the Indian Act property rights, your market is limited to the band, uh, band members, which could be a 50 individuals. By embracing individual uh, property ownership, you increase the market uh, available and create all sorts of uh, investment opportunities and wealth generating activities. So we think it's a, obviously we think it's an important uh, part of, of addressing uh, indigenous poverty in this, in Canada, uh, but we don't think obviously it's going to be the magic bullet. Understood. John Kay? I don't think there's any magic bullet, but um, you know, in the same way that North Korea and South Korea are different, you know, private property is, makes a huge difference in people's lives. And there's, there are microcosms for this. Uh, Fort Albany, Ontario is an, extraordinary microcosm of this. I went to see a beautiful home in Fort Albany, and it was, it was more beautiful than any of the homes I'd seen. And I said, wow, how, how, how'd you get permission to build this on the reserve? The guy had built it with his own hands over two years, and he said, see the reserve line, it's over there. The guy built it outside the reserve because that was the only way he was able to build the house he wanted. You go on the reserve, and it is just basically cookie cutter, three bedroom homes provided by the band, in the same way that if you went to a communist country, you'd find cookie cutter homes, because that's what, that's what governments and collectives do. On the other side of Fort Albany, I found this great rooming house. The, the rooms are 135 bucks a night. The guy was making a killing. I stayed there. Again, off the reserve. He could not have built that property on the reserve. So you had flourishing businesses. They were all done off reserve because that was where you could buy the land, you could control the land, you could profit from the land. These people were making money operating businesses in the same way that anyone here in Toronto can do that. But it's very difficult to do on the reserve. And it's not because these people aren't industrious people. You know, we, we then went to Attawapiskat. I went with this fellow who built this gorgeous house. And, you know, he was shaking his head because in Attawapiskat, a lot of the people got free trailers from De Beers. In, in the matter of five years, or four years, between 2009 and 2013, a lot of these trailers are completely unlivable now. How come? The people don't own the trailers. They have absolutely no interest in maintaining them. There's no private property, right? Why are they going to spend a single cent or any elbow grease in maintaining property they don't own? Hmm. And that's the same thing in any relationship where you have no stake in the property, you have absolutely no interest in maintaining it, mold is in the basement, you don't care because you didn't pay for that property, uh, you will get another house if you're connected to band leadership. But this, is, this isn't, by the way, an indictment of the people who live in the community. It is, it's the system. It's a part of human nature. If you don't have a property can, can interest in something, you're not going to take care of my, it. My mother and her twin sister have a very nice house in reserve that they built themselves with a certificate of possession. Where and they, they don't own the land. Up in the Paw, Manitoba, they don't own the land. Don't own the land. Don't own the land. And yet, still, it's a very nice house. There's no mold in the basement. Is it problematic that they don't own the land? Not for them, no. The, as far as they're concerned, I think they've made an investment in the physical infrastructure. And the market for their house is very small, but they'll sell it when the time comes. So I, I, I just mean that that, that is a story 
but it's not the story, and it's not freedom. a true story. Don't you want to give them the same freedom that you and I have here in Toronto? To buy and sell, lease, mortgage a property, the same right that every other Canadian enjoys. I'm not in don't the you think they deserve that right? giving people rights. I, but we're talking about that I in the show. I do believe that people should be able to choose the kinds of lives that they want, and for us to make those decisions for them is, I think, politically is untenable. Is it paternalizing to say the life you deserve no, is one where your freedoms are restricted? No, I think it's paternalizing for you to tell First Nations communities what they need to do. We're talking and about, to say the that Indian my Act. mother's house is in the Indian Act. This isn't the Indian that's Act. It's 1876 Indian Act. So we're talking about something that's encoded in Canadian law, not something that these people chose themselves. Again, I'm saying some communities this might be helpful for them. It's just I think it's wrong to focus on it. It's fetishistic to focus why on property in this way. On? It's the most basic aspect of Western civilization. It's why we're rich. So why is it wrong to focus on the thing that made Western countries rich? Um, I don't know that it is, in fact, what made private or ma made uh, uh, Western civilization rich. But I think that First Nations cultures think of themselves as having been very rich cultures before the arrival of Europeans and without these kinds of notions of private property. And I think it denigrates First Nations to say that they're somehow less advanced because they may not have shared me, these notions. Let me get the out-of-towners into this one. Tobold and, uh, first, and then Christopher, can I have you weigh in on this, please? Tobold, you first. Well, it, it's um, the private property model is interesting because it, it really doesn't get us out of the Indian Act at all. Uh, the private property models that are out there all deal with bands and reserves, and bands and reserves are constructions that are entrenched in the Indian Act. If you want to uh, uh, permit or uh, allow Indigenous communities to take up a, property, a private property rights regime, then you have to allow them to do it as nations over their traditional territories. If you restrict it arbitrarily to reserves, you're just reinforcing the Indian Act. Uh, the other thing to say about it is that Canada's obligation right now is to assist these communities in building up capacities. Uh, it's not to open another hallway in the labyrinth of colonialism and uh, act as if we're giving them some great options. Uh, it, they, uh, these communities went under duress, uh, under the duress of colonialism and uh, the, the legacy of residential school systems and the poverty, uh, just opening them up to uh, the markets, domestic markets and global markets, um, without also allowing them to have uh, legitimate and supported self-government regimes is, is, is a recipe for disaster. So this is why the Royal Commission uh, observed that if you're going to uh, have any economic changes, any changes to the economic structures of uh, indigenous communities, they have to be tied to changes in governance structures. So if you're going to get rid of the property restriction and investment restrictions on reserves or the traditional lands, you have to get rid of the, self, the, the governance uh, restrictions as well so that these communities can actually make a, a real choice about whether they want to pursue private property over their lands. Christopher? Yeah, you know what? You know, I think um, that's right. Is you can't separate uh, economic institutions from political institutions; they go together. Uh, and uh, you know, on the other hand, we do believe that I think history has shown that uh, that private property rights uh, are, are do have very positive outcomes. History has shown that. Uh, but but our, our point would be that imposing it from above uh, is not going to work. Uh, given the way in which Indian policy has evolved in this country, that the only way that uh, the Indian Act is going to change in any meaningful ways has to come from the grassroots. And, and that's what's occurring. We have 10 First Nations led by uh, Chief Manny Jules, who wants this type of legislation. Uh, and eventually, First Nations can judge for themselves whether or not they uh, want to opt into, it, opt into this uh, legislation or not. And they can decide and see the, the results and evolve into it, uh, opt into it, as uh, time uh, as time goes on, so I think in the end, if you want to get rid of the Indian Act, this is the way it's going to have to be done. And First Nations that oppose this type of stuff uh, need to uh, respect the sovereign rights of those First Nations that want this type of legislation, whether it's uh, individual property rights in our case or any other type of legislation. I think that a voluntary opt-in approach with a diverse set of solutions is is the way to go. And First Nations need to respect other First Nations that want to choose these different paths. So I, I must agree with uh, Jonathan. I don't understand the oppo I don't understand the opposition uh, to this type of legislation or any other type of bottom-up uh, demand for Indian Act reform that the government is willing to address. Because uh, that, that's that, that's the way. If you want to respect Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination, then you have to respect other First Nations' choices and, let, and don't get in their way. Jonathan. Um, I think it's a great idea to focus on grassroots uh, advocacy for private property solutions. And I just wanted to mention one example I saw in Moose Factory Island, James Bay, because Moose Factory Island 
very interesting place because it's shared by two Cree communities. Uh, one is the Moose Cree First Nation. They have a reserve. It's sort of a traditional um, setup. And then you have a people called the Mokribek. And the Mokribek, very interesting, they're actually Cree who came over from Quebec uh, to attend the residential school. They're Protestants. Um, and then they never ended up going back to Quebec, so they sort of became like the Palestinians of the, the Creed, sort of an orphan. <laughs> when did of, this have happened? This happened a couple of decades ago, back in the 60s and 70s, and they stuck around. But the interesting thing is that uh, in around 1979, 1980, one of their leaders, a guy by the name of Alain Jolie, said, uh, you know, my people are destitute, and he built up a community. Uh, they now have a thriving business sector there. They own their own homes. And what's interesting is he did it all outside of the Indian Act. They are not even a federally recognized band. How did he manage to do that? He did that. What he did is he subdivided the land. He uh, bought for $1,300, he paid the taxes on the, church, uh, on the land, which was owned by the Anglican Church. Uh, he got hydro installed. He got basic utilities installed. It was pri basically private land when he had it. And he basically became a real estate developer. Uh, and so he got housing for his people. And so now, and they started a cable business. Uh, you know, they have challenges. They, they have a fine hotel where I stayed. But what's interesting is they did it all outside the Indian Act. They did it all outside those strictures. And now he's kind of happy the way it turned out because he said, we have freedom. We have private property rights and we're not dictated to according to an 1876 template. Just curious, how'd you get there? To uh, Moose Factory? Uh, well, you fly to Timmins, then you fly to Moosonee. And what's great is actually it's counterintuitive. You figure, well, it's the middle of winter, it's hard to get around. It's actually easier to get around in the winter because you can travel the ice road. You can actually drive from Moosonee to Attawapiskat on the ice road, which is a terrifying experience in its own right, but at least you can drive. It's actually easier to get around these places when it's minus 30 than when it's 30 degrees in the summer. And how, from, from leaving in Toronto till arrival there, how long? You can get to Moosonee in about five or six hours. To get to Attawapiskat takes uh, most of the day because it's, it's, it's north of there. Yeah. Gotcha. But it's, by the way, it's expensive. $800 ticket just to get from Attawapiskat to Moosonee. It's the same price of flying to Toronto, L.A. That's huh. one of the reasons it's so challenging for these communities is, uh, you know, everything's expensive. No volume discounts, are there? I, one of the things I did for the National Post is I, I actually went and took uh, photographs of the prices that these people pay in grocery stores. Hmm. And it's actually one of the huge impediments to living there is how much everything costs. Hmm. One of the reasons we're talking about this is, of course, the government of Canada has decided to amend uh, many pieces of legislation or submit new bills to Parliament uh, dealing with the Indian Act. And I just want to cover a few of them right now, and then, Douglas, I'll get you to comment first on this. Here's the list. It's a healthy list. Bill C-45, the Jobs and Growth Act of 2012, that's the uh, omnibus budget bill. Bill C-27, an act to enhance the financial accountability and transparency of First Nations. Bill S-6, the First Nations Elections Act. Bill S-2, Family Homes on Reserves and Matrimonial Interests or Rights Act. Bill S-8, Safe Drinking Water for First Nations Act. Bill C-428, an act to amend the Indian Act and to provide for its replacement. Now, obviously, Douglas, in its wisdom, these different proposals from the federal government aim to improve the lives of sure. First Nations people who are living in Canada, in which case, why are idle no more protesters so opposed to so much of what they've introduced? Yeah, I think it comes down to... Um there's two issues always, and one of them is process and one of them is resources. So um, if you look at sort of the uh, Fiscal Accountability Act, for example, um, the subheading of the act is, or in the introductory note to the act, it says that it's designed to make it, um, to provide more information to voters uh, on a band about what's happening with the financial, uh, the financial accountability in their communities. But what the act actually does is it actually makes that uh, information available to everyone in Canada. So it, it, the narrow scope of should First Nations persons uh, living in reserve communities have more access to the financial disclosure? Absolutely. Does that mean that everyone needs to not necessarily and one of the reasons for that is is if you're a First Nations community uh, who's dealing with several resource companies uh, in your region uh, you often negotiate confidential deals with one of those parties and then a confidential agreement with, with another party and it's important that the the in order for the band to leverage those negotiations that they remain confidential <laughs> a you, full you think there's some standing behind confidentiality here though that is preventing <coughs> better governance no, First Nations, uh, you can get a you spend $5 and file a freedom 
Freedom of Information request and get all of that information, right? So there are already ways for that information to be disclosed. And I, again, I think that most First Nations would probably not be opposed to the narrower version. If you look at S2, um, that's the safe water one. What that purports to do is to, well, one, it allows First Nations to work with the Crown to develop uh, regulations around water safety. So all good. I don't think anybody's um, uh, against that. Uh, but then it purports to transfer authority for those water systems uh, to First Nations. And the water systems have been under serious pressure. They're very old for the most part. They're failing. Uh, and so transferring um, the uh, authority for them also transfers the liability for them. And there's no funding that comes with that bill. That's so, the again, objection. That's, I think, the objection. Uh, the Matrimonial Property Act, I think, provides really important protections uh, for non-Indian men or women uh, who are, are divorced. Um, and allows them to have some rights in the in the family home. Um, it also allows First Nations communities to opt out and to have their own system of matrimonial property. But again, there's not doing that's a very long term, very expensive process. There's no resources provided to develop that okay. alternative system. So it de facto creates uh, a common law system and reserve. Those are some of the specifics. I now want to go to Tobold in British Columbia, who can perhaps talk to us about the process. We often hear that meaningful negotiations or meaningful consultation doesn't take place between the government of Canada and First Nations representation. And I guess I need a better understanding of what, in your view, would constitute meaningful consultation if, in your view, it hasn't happened yet. Well, so meaningful cons uh, consultation is really the minimal democratic requirement for, for, uh, for going forward with any kind of legislation. It's a product of a very Supreme Court uh, decisions in 2004, 2005, and uh, it's, it's really the minimum. Uh, meaningful consultation should uh, include um, some sort of decision-making powers. So uh, this is why uh, the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People says that uh, we have to gain consent, not simply uh, consultation. And uh, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People says that we actually need a, a, something like a third order of government in order to do this democratically. Uh, me simply setting up a uh, consultation process, uh, which we've seen this a number of times, uh, and hearing out uh, in, uh, in these communities' concerns and then going ahead with projects isn't going to, isn't helping anybody. And it's certainly not uh, helping us, uh, help, helping the, the Idle No More movement is going to get even more uh, upset about this kind of thing uh, go going forward. Well, Christopher, one of the things I've heard from some Aboriginal representatives that I've spoken to, First Nations I've spoken to, is that they aren't convinced that representatives of the government of Canada are negotiating with them or relating to them as equals. They want to be seen as, if you like, an equal, distinctive level of government within the Canadian family. Is that still a problem in your view? That they, that they, they uh, want to be uh, seen as equal? Is that a problem? Uh, uh, I guess, uh, I don't think it's a problem. Um, uh, it's certainly true. I've done some research uh, on, uh, on treaty, modern treaty negotiations between uh, Aboriginals and, and, uh, and the Crown, and the rhetoric there is that uh, there has to be a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, uh, but you know, it's, you know, the evidence suggests that that does not tend to be the case on the Crown side. Uh, both from my research and from in, informal conversations with uh, government officials, uh, is that a, is that a problem? I don't think so. I think uh, I think the crown is willing to entertain those notions and to and to and to treat uh, First Nations uh, in that way on some instances, but not on others. So um, so yeah, that's what. That's Let me get John on this. Uh, the, the the demand that it be nation to nation negotiation is that a non-starter for too many people in Canada? Uh, I think there's a lot of people, you know, who think it's a little odd. Uh, if you have 650 First Nations communities, reserve resident population about 400,000, so the average nation may have 700 people on it. I think a lot of people just aren't used to using the word nation in that way. The bigger problem, I think, is that it doesn't matter what terminology you use. The nature of negotiations between two parties, whatever the terminology, is always going to be based on the power imbalance between those two people. And there is a power imbalance. There is a power imbalance and it's based on money. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that even if you don't like the way the federal government delivers funding to reserves, the fact of the matter is under the current situation we fund them rather than vice versa. So what you need to create if you want ultimately sort of long-term political equilibrium is you need to create more of an economic equilibrium, which means more uh, uh, independence, 
uh, more resource generation, better education, more jobs. I've always thought that the focus has to be on creating jobs and creating education. And I think a lot of the hang-ups about terminology um, are a little bit misplaced. It's a little bit ornamental. Is that a problem calling it hang-ups? I mean, by, by describing them as hang-ups over terminology, yeah. you're planting your flag pretty clearly with one side of I guess in the ha hang-ups, I guess I'm focusing more on the idle no more protesters. Uh, in, in terms of the First Nations chiefs and the, the council, I mean, a lot of them, for very important historical reasons, they do want certain terms used because they were historically recognized in that capacity. So I don't want to denigrate their assertions in that respect. But if we're talking about the idle no more protesters, if we're talking about some of the political theatrics in Ottawa surrounding Theresa Spence's hunger strike, I think there's maybe too much of a focus on the procedurals, who visits who, who's in the room at the time. I think more of the focus should be on how do you create jobs and how do you improve education. And by the way, there is a a very good substantial demand, which I think First Nations uh, protesters have had, and I don't know more protesters have had, which is funding for schools on First Nations reserves. It's a federal formula funding, it's about $7,000 per student, and they have a good case on this because you have provincially run schools in the area which often get a lot more than $7,000 per student. So, I mean, that to me, the focus should be on very specific things like that. But let me follow up one more thing with you, which is. In, in the private sector, you can worry about outcomes, and that's it, that's all. And a lot of people don't particularly get hung up on the niceties of how you get to your eventual destination as long as you get there and people are happy. This is the world of politics. Process matters. How you get there is almost as important as where you end up. Would you not agree with that that's a, yeah. a key concern in all of this? Yes, but that's part of the problem because I think because the negotiating partners are always chief and council, or their lobbying organization, which is the, the Assembly of First Nations, there's a bias in all of this toward the, uh, the interests of the prevailing order, which is uh, chief and council. This is actually one of the ironies of the Idle No More movement. Idle No More movement is about empowering grassroots. I mean, that's why Judy Rebick and stuff get involved. And yet, right now, First Nations politics in the country are really, at least the AFN level, are about protecting the interests of chief and council. If what I would like to see more in the in coming years is really sounding out ordinary people who live on First Nations and ask them basic things like, do you want to own your home and the property under it? Douglas, if it's a case of obsessing over process at the expense of getting to the finish line, is nothing going to happen? Well, let me just go back and uh, let me just go back and say, first of all, I don't think it's ever a problem uh, for people to want to be equal partners in a negotiation because to ask to be an equal partner is just to be asked is just to ask to be treated with the respect and dignity that you should accord human beings when you negotiate with them. So, whether no, no matter how you want to phrase that, I think what people want is a process where they're treated with respect, and that means listening to what they want. So, I, for example, have no real issue with the idea that legislation gets passed uh, that allows some communities to opt in f to uh, private property regimes. You're okay with that? I am okay with that. I, what I don't think is that it should be the very first thing that we do because that's not what the majority of First Nations are asking for. I think they're asking for other kinds uh, of uh, authorities within their communities and uh, different processes for identifying those uh, their particular demands and where they overlap with the greater but, Canadian society. But I society. think, I don't want to speak for him, but I think that's one of John's points, which is there's, there's this great As I obsession said, right now on band rights and, and nation rights as opposed to individual rights. As I said at the beginning, it's, gonna, it's very complicated yeah. and it will require very complex discussion and agreement over a long series. But I think the bigger problem, or one of the big problems that we need to really talk about is uh, the question of resources. And let, let me just first say that, you know, you talked about you, First Nations are paid for with our taxes. And I'm First Nations, I'm Cree from Northern Manitoba. I also pay taxes. And, you know, we're all paying for this in the same way that through uh, the equalization payments as part of Confederation, we all suck it up to support other provinces, right? So this is all just sort of part of what it is to be part I have a of Confederation. That too, by the way. Just, yeah, okay, <laughs> fair enough. But I think that. that First Nations could be brought into Confederation. So for example, the, the funding formula that exists with respect to First Nations communities now, it has no basis in legislation. It's all the policy decisions of uh, the Department of Indian Affairs or Aboriginal Affairs or whatever they call themselves now. Um, and so it's hard to negotiate from the First Nations side with an entity that is able to make all of its decisions through just discretionary policy settings. And it's not just that there's problems on the First Nations side about you can't, you know, there's too many actors and they can't decide what they want. On the government side as well, there's no legislative basis for a lot of the action that Ab Department of Aboriginal Affairs is taking in communities. And so it can take different actions in different communities um, 
without paying attention to the principles of the decisions uh, that they're making. And okay. so that has been a problem, uh, I think, for many years. Let me go to Tobold in British Columbia then, and, and let me get you to focus on the point that Jonathan Kay was making, which is if you're going to get rid of the Indian Act, or if, however we want to use that language, if we want to significantly amend it, reform it, and so on, would it be a good idea to focus laser-like on the property rights issue in whatever succeeds the Indian Act with the view that that's how you make progress? Well, the, my answer is pretty short and simple. It's that uh, we're not in the position to decide that. That's up to the communities to make those decisions. Uh, and we have to hear them and we have to respond to them. Uh, this isn't new, and it's not even a new conversation. We had this conversation back in the early 90s. Uh, it was through a four-year royal commission to try and figure out what it would mean to meaningfully move out of the Indian Act and grant autonomy to Indigenous communities to help them economically and uh, educationally in terms of health and well-being. And the result was that, yes, economics is important, but it has to be economics in, uh, followed through uh, through the, uh, the leadership of Indigenous communities, not Canada. So Canada's obligation right now is not to decide what's best for Indigenous communities. This is just going to reiterate the same paternalistic colonialism that we've been dealing with. Okay, Canada's well, obligation let me jump in here. right now, according to Section 35 of the Constitution and the UN Declaration, right, is to afford uh, Indigenous communities the kind of autonomy that they've been asking for so that they can make the decisions. Uh, it's up to them to make the decisions. I hear you, except... I also read what Tim Harper wrote in the Toronto Star, sorry to quote a competing newspaper there, but last Friday, Tim Harper wrote the following. As he rode to a meeting with Prime Minister Stephen Harper last Friday, Sean Atlio's Blackberry buzzed, referring to the head of the Assembly of First Nations. Quote, since you have decided to betray me, all I ask of you now is to help carry my cold, dead body off this island, the text message said. It was sent in the name of Chief Teresa Spence, but those who saw the text believe it came from someone else in her circle on Victoria Island. But they were certain about one thing. The timing, moments before he went into one of the most important meetings of his life, was meant to destabilize the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations and undermine his efforts at a meeting which many in his organization fiercely opposed. Uh, you say that the, those involved need to be consulted. You see that those involved need to make sure that they are heard during the course of this process, but there's a thousand different voices coming out of this. So how do you want to handle that, Tobold? Well, yeah, there's, I mean, there was a thousand voices coming out of the civil rights movement as well. Uh, the diversity of voices certainly isn't a knock against uh, the, uh, the need for uh, rights. Um, so again, Canada's focus shouldn't be disagreement within the movement. Canada's focus should be on its responsibilities. We've committed to these. I mean, we've put it in our constitution. We've enshrined it. And so now we need to follow through. We've got a plan. It's a 20-year plan uh, that came out at the Royal Commission. Uh, we, don't even have, we don't have to concern ourselves with disagreements within the Idle No, no, no More movement. Uh, they're going to happen. They're natural. It's part of a process that movements all go through. And the I mean, the focus on it is telling, though, because this is the same kind of focus uh, that you see from dominant societies on other movements. So the civil rights movement went through this same sort of denigration in the press, the pointing out of division within the movement. Uh, the women's movement even had it. So uh, I think this speaks to a, a, a kind of irresponsibility on the part of the, the media, especially, to focus on what Canada's responsibilities are, not to, you know, to uh, gossip about what kind of div um, divisions are occurring in the movement at well, the time. Uh, hang on, Chris, uh, let me, Christopher, let me bring you in at this point. I mean, it's not, it's not gossip to say that, on the one hand, you've got Sean Atlio of the AFN going to a meeting with the Prime Minister of the country, uh, a pretty important meeting with the Prime Minister of the country, and then as he's going into this meeting, his Blackberry buzzes and basically somebody's saying, you know, you're killing me by going to this meeting, and what you're attempting to do is completely not constructive to the, to the future of our people. I mean, that's, that's more than gossip. That's a pretty significant divergence of views, is it not? Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's two points here that I think are important. One is that the Idle More, we need to think broadly what the Idle No More movement is actually about. And it's, about, it's a rejection of the way that the Crown and the uh, and, and Indigenous chiefs and governments have uh, related each other over the last hundred years. So it's an indictment of not only the Crown's approach to Indigenous policy, but also mainstream leadership's uh, approach to the way in which uh, relationships are being negotiated. So that's the first thing. So I think those 
those divisions are real and important. What should be the Crown's responsibility in this case is to empower First Nations to make choices, right? And so that means creating the conditions that allow for First Nations to make informed choices that uh, reflect their goals and their circumstances. And so uh, one way of doing that is to address the, the, the immense poverty that exists across reserves. Once you address those issues, those basic housing issues, education, health care, uh, and the like, then you, will, you, you give uh, First Nations the ability to make <laughs> Uh, and make good choices in, in terms of opting out of the Indian Act. So there's a number of ways that the Crown can do that. One is what uh, what we wrote, wrote, up, wrote about in our book is, is allowing uh, you know, uh, different types of amendments to the Indian Act, such as property ownership through voluntary approaches. Another more bold way, I think, which I, which I wrote about again in the Toronto Star, sorry, Jonathan, again, competing newspaper, was to revive the Kelowna Accord um, uh, model. And the Kelowna Accord model, which has been criticized on a number of issues, would be a but would have been criticized, but also uh, uh, creates a potential uh, solution to this problem because it'll, it 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 was about addressing the main issues that uh, affect all uh, all uh, communities across Canada: education, healthcare, uh, housing, water, accountability, and transparency, which rarely gets talked about. Was uh, was covered in the uh, Kelowna Accord and taking that Kelowna model. Uh, expanding on it, addressing some shortcomings that were in it, such as uh, Indigenous women, uh, urban Aboriginals, setting out a clear vision, making a statement, a new royal proclamation. I think we just missed uh, having some audio troubles there. We'll get those fixed. But Douglas, it, with just a couple of minutes to go here, okay, Kelowna, that was Paul Martin's you know, yep. great leap forward. Uh, well, that's a terrible expression to use, but you know what I'm trying to say here. He, uh, his big effort to try to make some progress on this. Uh, the current government of Canada canceled Kelowna, mm -hmm. and it seems unlikely that the current government of yep. Canada is going mm -hmm. to reinstitute the Kelowna process. In which case, what's something that can be done in the short run to make some progress on this? A, a big lottery windfall. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. What we're talking there is no short term. I think these are very long term and they're structural problems. So one of the things I think if you're looking, if you're serious about reforming the Indian Act, um, is to talk about the way First Nations are able to gain revenue. So we've already talked about uh, access to capital through private property. Uh, but another is uh, the First Nations have very limited powers of taxation. So for example, I think. Um, as a First Nations person from the Opaskwiat Cree Nation, I should, for example, be able to pay my federal income tax to my home community. Uh, and that's a way that uh, First Nations people who uh, live off reserve are able to provide support to, uh, to their home communities. Now, that may not sound like it's going to be a lot of money, but if you do the math uh, on the Kelowna Accord, this is kind of what it looks like. It's $5 million over five years. Is that a good One idea? Actually, I love the idea of creating a constituency because once you start taxing people, then people like you yep. go and they go to the reserve and say, I'm paying my tax money here. Demand accountability. And, and that's how accountability starts. I, it's, it's not a bad idea. The, the math is it's a billion dollars a year for 500 First Nations. There's actually 630. That's $200,000 per year. That's not enough to make any significant gains, and it's only for five years in health and education and housing. So although it sounds like a lot of money, it's actually not. What you need to do is to build uh, and to talk about ways to build uh, taxation into the system that allows First Nations uh, to contribute back to their home communities the symbol, over the long term. The symbolism right? of that, I think, would I presume you're going to tell us would be equally as important as the actual finances of it. Uh, well, I, I think there is. It, it, what it does is it starts getting us into the right sort of structural relationship between First Nations, uh, First Nations who live on and off reserve, and the Crown. And that's part of the piece that, that we've been missing. So um, allowing First Nations to collect revenue from their members is probably one of the best ways of getting that funding relationship right. It will not, in the end, uh, fully finance First Nations communities for many, many years. But it'll but do it's, something. it's the right John way. John Kay, last 30 seconds to you. It's a great idea. No taxation without representation, but also no representation without America. But also no representation without taxation. Once you start taxing people, they de make demands. I think education is a huge thing. I went to Fort Albany. They have a new school there. It makes all the difference for a community. Once you have good education, properly funded, then you can create the job skills, then you can get the employment, then you get the wealth, and then you can really have a nation-to-nation -nation relationship because they're economically equal, not just equal in name only. Gotcha. I want to thank everybody for participating in tonight's discussion. Really appreciate your help on this. Christopher Alcantara in California via Skype. He's the Associate Professor of Politics at Wilfrid Laurier University. Tobold Rolo at, uh, in Victoria, British Columbia. He's the PhD candidate from the Department of Poli Sci at U of T. Jonathan Kay, the columnist of the National Post. 
Douglas Anderson, Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Toronto. Good to have all of you here in studio and in Points Beyond. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.